social media pages and accounts often turn into memories when someone dies, giving people a chance to still feel connected to the ones they've lost. But after we're gone, who owns the information on our pages? And who can access it? Fahim Hussam, assistant professor for the School for the Future of Innovation in Society, joins me to discuss his research and interest on the digital afterlife and how this affects religion and culture. And it's not just an individual concern, but a global one. Join us as we get rebelliously curious. Sahim, thank you for joining me on Rebelliously Curious today. So you are the assistant professor uh, for School for Future Innovation in Society, and you also have a very large interest within the digital afterlife. So thank you for being on the show today. Thank you for having me. So first, I'd like to start off. What is the School for Future Innovation in Society? Like, it sounds like a school that I would want to go to. And I know a lot of people listening to this will probably want to go to. So uh, what is that? And, and where is it? Um, I'm still figuring it out. Uh, but <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> uh, the School of uh, Future of Innovation in Society is an interdisciplinary school. It's fairly new, uh, which uh, started um, in Arizona State University. And right now it's under the College of Global Future. So it's a lot of future involved. Uh, so our motto is uh, future is for everyone. So the way I see it, um, me as a technology for development researcher, um, to make sure that when we talk about future, we actually need to talk about futures and uh, there are different levels of futures. And we also need to define future for whom and defined by whom. Uh, so the whole idea of inclusion is very much important. Hence the society needs to be involved, not just a certain part of it. And when we talk about technology innovation, that has to be inclusive, that has to evolve in a way that ensures justice, equity. So that that's where we are. Wow. Actually, that's it's wonderful. I'm glad we're even looking at that within programming for students and looking mm -hmm. at, you know, in integrating it into corporate as well. I think that's fabulous. So the digital afterlife plays a part in that. So how did you get involved in this interest and area of study of the digital afterlife? Uh, it's it's been a while. It's uh it's I think since 2010, 12. If you remember, uh, during those times, you have you may know option. Uh, still have it in in Facebook. And uh, what really bothered me, I kept seeing some of the people that I knew are dead, but Facebook was suggesting me that I should be knowing them or I should be connecting with them. So that started my uh, inquiry about this of what what's happening and then i've been documenting uh, the policies or the absence of those uh, in different digital platforms of what to do uh, what they do with uh, in terms of uh, the user's account so that was the initial surface level inquiry that i had but eventually it uh, panned out uh, in the last few years to different types of uh, questions related with what happens to our data when we are not here physically, like biologically, then what, what is the impact on the society? Uh, and then also, what are the services that's coming around uh, these uh, phenomena? And it's, it's, it's uh, tremendously... Uh, exciting as a researcher to look into this literally wild west of uh, one of the technology implications that we haven't seen this before, uh, that we are delving into kind of like a pseudo immortality, but it's not in our own hand. Uh, so the a type of jurisdiction plays a part. So there, there are so many things uh, there. It's a buffet of interesting research inquiries, but in also, there are some disturbing concepts and ideas and practices here as well. Right. And so why should people be concerned about their digital afterlife? Because, you know, you're you're living on Earth and then you're gone. You know, does why was it why would it matter? I think that's what somebody would ask here. Why should I really be concerned about it when I don't have to deal with it on a daily? Right. So before we talk about why should we be concerned about digital afterlife, we need to have an understanding of what is digital afterlife. For and sure. even before that, you, you see in the human history, uh, I think since the dawn of our civilization, human kind has been fascinated with afterlife, right? We we are building monuments, like imagine the pyramids or uh, 
or imagine Taj Mahal or so many other monuments. The human civilization have been investing a lot on these uh, concepts of afterlife. It has been there. That's that's nothing new. So when we talk about digital afterlife, it's primarily talking about our footprints uh, that we have. We we are living in uh, in different digital spaces, willingly or unwillingly, uh, and then. What happens to those things when we are not there? Now, is this something new in terms of our, our post-mortem artifacts? No, uh, we, we we kind of figured out how to do, you know, if this watch is here, I know exactly where it should be because that if I'm not there. Uh, but the problem is uh, with the digital content, uh, it has some sort of a, a transcending effect. And uh, the you know and it crosses multiple platforms and we have enough technology and uh, you know applications at our disposal right now that uh, our presence can be there even after we are not there uh, and that presence can have some sort of an intelligence uh, uh, to, to have their own lives quote unquote or our own personal data can be used to uh, uh to be manipulated or to be mashed up or to be morphed to some other being and have an impact in the real world so there are certain things that can be done and also imagine the personal information now let's talk about uh the phones that we have right now the physical self of our cell phones um it's it's a it's a plastic glass slab it, it 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 it's a physical thing but imagine there are so many platforms and so many applications within now maybe i'm not comfortable my son to have access to my linkedin account maybe i'm not comfortable to my wife or somebody to have access to some something else so then how you define and demarcate those digital artifacts or properties uh, uh among um, uh, among the people who are lived behind or who would be have the ownership if i cannot define it myself uh, so this whole idea of this data overlord uh, of this uh, new uh, I, I i would not say colonization but at the same time these new entities that's kind of defining our own spaces as we go along uh, where the digital space and our physical space are kind of uh, mixing and matching um, so that became very very confusing so that's why i think uh, to answer your question in a long windy way uh, we should be concerned about digital afterlife yeah, I love how you explain that from even like a beginning with a historical point, because we look at like Mesopotamia, for example, and having tablets that are over 5,000 years old, that's like an artifact, but it's, you know, it's some way pr preserving that time and space and what they thought, like, I think they, they still find like receipts and things like that, that they're digging up um, within that, within that area. And then we look at, yeah, the cell phone being an artifact as well too, but we go a, a, a step above that where now it's kind of in this cloud and it's sitting around us as well that we people can interact with. So there is this really interesting progression where we look at different types of artifacts and then moving into the cell phone really being an artifact itself, but holding that digital content. Mm -hmm. So I find that it's, it's interesting. And then we see where we're going to go next. And you talk about the privacy section of that. And I think that that's really important. You know, what kind of privacy do we have now for our digital afterlife or just in, in general for our, our digital afterlife that we have currently on Facebook or Meta, let's say, or Instagram? And then what is that going to look like in the future? Um, again, as I mentioned, it's a wild west. Um, there is no... Uh, it, I find it a bit disturbing in a way because imagine this. Uh, I'll, I'll step back a bit and then I'll come back, I'll come to your thing. Okay. Because there are there are certain certainties uh, if you are talking about product design uh, in the digital space that you are designing for humans uh, in different societies, different perspectives, and we are we are going to die. That's for certain. Uh, so if that's the case, when we're designing a product, there should be something that kind of address that certainty, but we do not do that. So that, that kind of baffles me or intrigues me, you can say. Why? Uh, because there has not been enough conversation 
even between the in the industry service providers have their own thing. They exactly know what they're doing, or at least I hope they know somewhat what they're doing. But the conversation is not there between, say, the civil societies or the experts or the activists uh, of uh, where our rights are and how it's kind of has the potential to be infringed. Uh, so the conversation is not there. Why I'm saying that? So the absence of those conversations, these vacuums, kind of created this opportunity uh, to have your own standard and you go your own way. So Meta is doing something and it has evolved. Uh, at least it's being addressing things. That's, that's I, I take it very positively. Um, LinkedIn has been doing a lot of catch up. Twitter is, uh, again, doing catch up. There are some other providers who are we are, we are actually not sure what they're trying to do. But let's not just focus on the social media aspect. There are so many other uh, digital service providers uh, where we have no idea what is the data policy and how does that impact the deceased or afterlife thing. For example, uh, I work uh, uh, in one of my key research interests is uh, displaced population and uh, the digital uh, like data justice. Uh, that's something that I'm very much intrigued about. Um, and this is where uh, I'm kind of baffled and appalled to see different uh, humanitarian organiza organizations have their black box when it comes to their data policy, sharing policy. So why I'm saying that, um, so that kind of creates um, a lot of confusions. And when you have this kind of lot of confusions, um, those uh, creates uh, the opportunity for manipulation and exploitation uh, at the wider wider scale. And imagine we're talking about digital spaces where our traditional good old geopolitical boundaries do not work that much uh, because we are all uh, citizens of Republic of Meta or Republic of Google or so many other things. Uh, and that creates uh, the opportunity for new identity, but also creates new challenges. Yeah, I would imagine. And how do we look at this even a religious context as well? Because you're going to have multiple cultural groups that are not going to agree on how their data is being preserved or how it's being stored or even, for example, yeah, being manipulated. Where does culture and religion play a part in this? Oh, my goodness. I'm, I'm, I'm so glad that you asked this, because somehow when we talk about technology innovation, we try to bypass uh, religion because it's one of the, you know, it's one of those uh, uh things that have worked uh, in different shapes and sizes uh, for thousands of years. So when we talk about design innovation, in that needs to be included in the conversation as well. Now, in, when we talk about religion, you need to have an understanding in this, that the my, my observation is that the social media platforms are very much excited to have the religious groups to be in, using their platforms. They're all vying for their attention that we see, good or for bad. So as users, they're very much included in the in the you know in the mix of it. But when we talk about religion in this whole digital uh, digital afterlife landscape, there are two ways to look into it. One is as we are talking about the post mortem impacts at the user level, at the societal level. The other is the immediate service ones. I will tell. Uh, I'll start with the latter. Um, in the last uh, couple of years, during the COVID pandemic and the global shutdowns, we have seen this uh, uh, explosion of uh, services, one-stop funeral services uh, online. Uh, we have seen, uh, we have observed this digital grave swiping uh, in China. We have seen online gurus uh, doing rituals uh, 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 for the deceased uh, uh, for in India, uh, and definitely in uh, different other places uh, where these, uh, uh, when people are putting into the grave, uh, it, it's being live streamed. Um, and then uh, there are so many things in Australia, in, here uh, in the North America, and all over the world. So what we have seen, it's a very interesting way of adaptation uh, uh, of uh, the technology to continue some of the normal thing, but in a new normal scenario. But this is not something new that happened. In Japan, uh, the people have been using QR code in their tombstones for years. Uh, that's not, that's we have seen before. It's it's nothing new for that. Um, so, but we have seen, as I said, uh, the the exploration explosion of uh, these things. Uh, it's, there was a massive growth because there was a demand. Uh, 
So that's one. But other thing, what we we observed is certain uh, religious ideas, and this is part this is part of my ongoing research as well. That how different religious uh, uh, schools of thoughts are looking into this digital space uh, uh, for interpret uh, in terms of interpretation when it comes to afterlife. Uh, now, what kind of certain rituals can be done online? What kind of certain rituals are not okay? And even the conversation: if I am present my videos or my AI version is present in the metaverse and I am DCS, uh, then uh, do I still collect points for my afterlife or not? Uh, so those are, or do I need to go to churches or synagogue or mosques uh, during uh, those, you know, religious days uh, as my digital self, even I'm dead. So these are these are funny questions, but at the same time, important questions because this kind of, we are kind of redefining our practices. So practice wise, it's an uncharted territory. Uh, as a researcher, I am inquiring with a wider scale of uh, uh, among the practicing different practicing groups to have an understanding. Uh, I can share uh, like the initial findings are all over. It's fascinating. I'm just uh, having a ball at it. So that's one. Now, when it comes to in in terms of the interpretations of the impacts of it, so I I can I I, I can start adhering to it beyond the service part of it, and this is where I think. As far as I know, the religious, different kind of religious uh, in, um, interpretations or um, what should I say, the school of thoughts has not been cons have not been consulted uh, uh, or at least in the dialogue. But that's part of a bigger problem that we are do not have. We're not talking about some obvious things and definitely different religious interpretations uh, and uh, uh, those are not included in the conversation. Uh, but that kind of focuses on a bigger problem here which is when we talk about design of these digital services that impacts the wider range of society, this is why uh, in the early part of our conversation, we are talking about SFIS, right? So that's uh, this is a present future problem. And this is where when we talk about a present and a future, for whom? For us. But designed by whom? Definitely not by us. And this is where I think there's a huge gap that needs to be addressed. I'm yeah, not sure that does no, that answer that's fabulous. Question. No, that was really, really well said. I was writing down so many things. You know, we look at too, like who's going to be designing it. We see now that there's even bias in coding. We see tons of it that we have, and that's something that we're trying to change. But moving forward too, you know, how do we program or develop something with, we're going to have our own intentional biases now that will be put into it, but then years down the road, it will change. So we're going to have to always be developing and ever evolving with this digital afterlife life because unfortunately if of our you know i shouldn't say unfortunately but if our digital afterlife is staying and we're consistently being you know immortalized in some form of way in the digital sphere we also have this you know potentially being canceled in the future too because of our past self even when we're not alive so with all of that like how do we get around bias encoding and then how do we even get around the concept of cancel culture within digital <laughs> within a digital afterlife uh, and beyond that, cancel culture is uh, the, one of the things that we are dealing right now. Um, right. Um, and uh, in, in a way that it's, if uh, I also say to just to, just to add to the cancel culture issues is uh, how to, how you interpret how you are going to be interpreted right now exactly it's it's scary now now there is just not that I I'll I'll, I'll try to scare you even more now imagine uh, because you first of all. There are studies that shows that I have a paper on that. We are talking about uh, digital walking deads. Uh, so where we, uh, uh, because I'm a big fan of that zombie uh, series. So the, the thing is, there are so many, there will be more dead accounts, deceased accounts uh, online uh, than uh, uh, the living uh, those uh, and are those going, going to be unattended some yes some no some those would be actually being farmed and used and manipulated to do so many other things right so that's one thing the other thing the way i see it is uh, there are uh, ways there are technologies right now where you can uh, recreate uh, past uh, personalities and then they can talk whatever now imagine 
uh, uh, if uh, some some heinous characters from our recent past or distant past come back and talk about the issues uh, right now uh, and how it can impact people, uh, even though everybody knows that they're not alive, but that can have huge impacts uh, on that. So imagine those interpretations. So we are, so agency is a big part of it. And uh, then how you consider your digital self after you are dead, um, uh, what kind of status they are going to have, what kind of, and let's push it forward and talk about what kind of legal implications are we talking about? Who is going to be responsible? Imagine if uh, some heinous characters talks about some massacres and uh, uh, who from the past, right? And uh, he, she, or they talk about something uh, that kind of inspires some very bad acts. Then who is responsible for that? The platform or the designer or uh, where it's being hosted? We don't know. This, this is definitely, uh, we have no idea. And uh, to make things worse, let's talk about the laws or the safety nets that we have. It's very confusing. Uh, uh, European Union is doing something else. Uh, to my opinion, they are doing something right. At least it's kind of pro-citizen, even though I have I've not been updated in the last six months. Uh, uh, us in the USA, we right now have um, certain acts, um, uh, certain policies, but it's kind of, again, in the absence of citizens dialogue, it's pro-industry. Uh, nothing against pro-industry, but I think the participation should be there for the from the citizens' point of view, which is not there. But my problem is not that. At least we have some laws and we can critique it. My huge problem is, we in the start of our conversation, we started talking about inclusion and equity, uh, is the growth of in the digital space in terms of human users, is not here. It's actually in the places in uh, Asia, in Sub-Saharan Africa, in the South America, and these are the these are the future growth places. These are the places where people are, and we are also heavily pushing. Oh, let's get digitized. Let's you know improve ourselves. Let's do this. Let's do that. Um, and those people with their own digital selves are very much vulnerable because we just do not have that kind of jurisdiction, that kind of policy implications there. And even if somebody from there wants to do something about, uh, like forget about the future implications. If somebody do not have access to their deceased uh, near, uh, near and dear one's accounts, they have to actually fight with somebody in California for that. Now imagine what kind of jurisdiction we're talking about. And in many cases, it's not even possible. In most cases, it's not possible for the global users to have an understanding standing and hold to their digital assets. So it's, it's, there's a lot of confusions um, that needs to be sorted out. Yeah. And you actually bridged into one of the questions I want to talk about was economical, you know, diversity, but also seeing a gap that might happen in this. And it's very, you know, not within our own countries within, you know, I'm Canadian, but within North America, we have those divisions and those gaps. But then we also see, which I think was really, really wonderful that you brought up that we look at other countries around the world, you know, developing nations or any country that's looking to advance their technology, but then what do they do about their privacy along with, then you're right, fighting with North Americans or larger established countries mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. this type of digital currency or, you know, afterlife currency as well. I, I think it's really important. So then what do we do then with that separation gap, even within, you know, our own, you know, continent, but then what about around the world as well? How do we create that there is no disparity within the digital afterlife? Or is that, not even possible. To be very practical, uh, there will always be disparity, but it also means that there there should always be efforts to get rid of it. Uh, so it's it's a moving bar. If we achieve something, we should achieve more. Uh, so that has to be there. Um, that's how I see it. If I put on my activist hat, uh, when it comes to uh, inclusion or equity within the digital space, I think there should be certain, there are several steps that need to be taken. First of all, I think uh, we, uh, there are some, I think, uh, small wins, quick wins that we can have. First of all, we need to start normalizing, talking about uh, these uh, deceased, uh, uh, you know, provisions and in the different multiple platforms. Sometimes it's hidden. Majority of the people do not have any idea how to do memorialization and whatnot. Um, and um, I, I lived in South Korea for so many years uh, for my work. And there, uh, even being one of the 
biggest uh, IT powers and economies, uh, uh, they, in many cases, they have no idea whatsoever of how to uh, do those things because uh, those uh, provisions are were not available during the time when I was researching in Hangul, in a Korean uh, language. So those kind of things are there. So we can definitely first norm, uh, try to normalize this conversation that the value of data, that's important. Then it's not just Let's oh be be my user, uh, be my things. Of course, the the platforms are going to do that. That's their selling point. But also use responsibly. Make sure this is a value of data, not just to build walls to protect. We normalize that, right? Remember that antivirus, anti piracy, whatnot. We normalized it. Also normalize. Hey, let's also talk about your data after you are done. It's very easy for me to say as an academic, but as a marketing ploy, when you are uh, selling something, oh, by the way, when you are dead, you are doing this. That's very depressing. So <laughs> this is something, and across culture, that doesn't work uh, very easily. So, but this is not, we, we can definitely solve it. So we should start doing that. That's one. Number two is definitely, definitely, we need to have um, include inclusive dialogues. And this is not about us versus them in, in, a, in a way, them being I don't know whom, but it, it's more because it's a, it's a newer applications and implications of technologies in the society. Um, uh, so this is something of, again, a present future issue that has not been figured out yet. And it has greater implications that we haven't seen before. But again, I think to have a better understanding, there should be dialogues, not at the higher level, but also like, for example, I will tell you, I I talk about the value of data with my nine-year-old son uh, when he's playing and he gives me some very interesting ideas and thoughts. So that's the important thing. When we talk about inclusion, it's also very important to not to just, uh, you know, confine ourselves to uh, certain groups. Uh, the users need to be uh, included in the conversations. But more importantly, that has been, I have been appalled by this, to include, uh, not to do othering in terms of this whole traditional geopolitical things. It's not a Northern problem. It's a global problem. It's a global issue. Let's not talk about a problem. It's a, it's a global issue. And it needs to be um, conversed and dealt with globally. Yeah, I think that's a, a very well said. You know, it is a global issue. It's going to affect everybody at some point in time in their life, throughout their entire life, through family, friends, and themselves. We see that potentially within the metaverse, there is this digital afterlife cemeteries that people are having conversations about right now. So for example, you'll be able to go into meta or into um, some form of metaverse that's created in the future and be able to put on a headset and be able to go see a loved one and be able to sit, maybe sit with them and have a conversation with them. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts? I, I think it's wild. I have so many questions after that too, but <laughs> what are your thoughts around the meta, you know, doing that within the metaverse, but also there's so much grief attached to it too. But uh, mm -hmm. first let's talk about what you think when it comes mm -hmm. to the metaverse and then these digital cemeteries that potentially might be created. Right. So Meta did not come up with it first, right? There, there had been so many, um, so many ideas toying around. There was one in South Korea that has been done. I can share the link with you uh, after the conversation where this uh, mother, grieving mother, talked with her uh, daughter who was eight year old. She died, and they they talked. Um, so all her data created this AI being. She was in the virtual reality. The mother went there with the HMD, H head mounted device, and they talked. They had a conversation. It was very touching, very disturbing. Uh, it's even if I'm talking about it, I have I have goosebumps. I think from a so this is very important from a grief management point of view. Um, I think this is an interesting aspect to look into. I would say. Again, this is a uh, millennia old aspirations of ours of talking to the deceased. Um, it has, it's nothing new for us. And uh, I'm not surprised that it's there. And I, uh, as, a, as a, I think uh, as, as a, at a personal level, I would love to have the chance. Now, that's one. But again, the things that I've talked to you before, there are certain consequences that comes with such interactions. Uh, and uh, right after Halloween, I don't want to be ominous about it, but it, it's, 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 it's not being ominous. But who then decides on the responsibilities of these implications that comes after that? 
of grief management. If I do something untoward after such consultations, or if I am so much addicted to that kind of conversation that I refuse to come out of those, right. uh, then how, how, how it impacts. So that's there. And also how different religions uh, or ideas and thoughts talk about those things because uh, as uh, as far I know and I'm no way any kind of religious expert but there are certain uh, you know guidelines of how you interact uh, with the deceased if you can or if you should at all so where, where are those but more importantly more importantly let's forget all this where is my right as a deceased person did I allow that uh, to do this so should we also, if I deal with somebody, somebody's digital being to manage my grief, isn't it also fair that we also need to, to somehow have some sort of a consent idea, I'm not sure how, of that deceased person as well when he or she was alive? I'm not sure. Because what if I'm not comfortable that, hey, no metaverse for me or no virtual thing for me. I don't want to talk to you after I'm dead. I want to be lived alone, right? I can right. do that. <laughs> right. You should have like, choice. Yeah. I should have choice. And uh, that's that's what kind of bothers me uh, that uh, if that's the case, then it's it's more like um, it's a, it's a feel good scenario for the people that who are living. But at the same time, I think we are... Um, kind of bypassing some of the other uh, implications of respect for the dead or the deceased. For sure. I would agree. And also our own mental health. How do you get over grief or learn how to deal with grief when you're consistently putting yourself back into an environment with somebody that is, you know, AI is creating this image of like a hologram mm -hmm. for you. So you were like, I would be scared. I'd be, st I would get stuck in that mm -hmm. and want to spend every day and in every mm -hmm. moment with them because you love them so much. So you know, grief's a huge conversation with mental health. And then we also look again back to economical structures and when in case I can't afford to put my loved one into meta. So that means I never get to see them again into a digital, you know, space, even though they maybe wanted that, but I can't uh -huh. afford it as a, as a, you know, as a, a parent, gosh, for, for hopefully not, but you know, as any form, a sister, a brother, a daughter, anyone mm -hmm. like that. So it's, mm -hmm. it's interesting to see how that's going to evolve. And I hope I'm not around <laughs> when that happens. Because you, it's, unfortunately, it's would be. it's the well, my digital, going... exactly. Well, you the know, it's funny enough. My, um, I always say to you with my IG, I look at my Instagram account and I almost consider it as a diary. It is a, it's a combination of my work, but it also has a combination of me. And as some people say to each other and a lot of friends that are influencers or work in the digital space, you know, never post something that you don't want on a billboard. Mm -hmm. And I think that's mm -hmm. a really great you know mm -hmm. way to, mm -hmm. to first, you know, look at it from your yes. digital assets, yes. but outside of it, for me, it's it literally the reason why I use my IG. And I always joke around that I don't use it appropriately or correct but i use it because for me when i'm older i know that's going to be a digital like artifact and i know that mm -hmm. is so i leave videos and i leave images of my life and my work so that when my nephew or anyone else looks back right, from years right, they actually right. are able to exactly. look and see and see who i am and know because uh -huh, uh -huh. i would have loved to met my great grandmother uh -huh, you know and see uh -huh. what she was like and all of that. So to me, that's, that's why I do it. It's a diary for myself, mm -hmm. but also maybe for others that will be able to get a little glimpse into my life and, and mm -hmm. what I was like during this time. But you know, what, what are your thoughts? I, and I should ask you personally, have you even have, you must be planning and mapping out your own digital afterlife now, because you're thinking about it all the time. Yes. And I haven't done that, uh, because okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm still shopping around. <laughs> that's fair. So that, um, now that was another question of mine. Where do you shop though? Like, where can you go now to really figure out your digital afterlife? Like what corporate companies are offering that oh, or any they're, they're, digital it's, services it's, that are offering? Yeah. It's a huge industry. It's a huge industry. But unfortunately, I think until recently, there has been, uh, uh, there. Uh, I'm definitely not naming names, but it has been glorified password keepers. Other than that, they were not doing much. But uh, uh, lately, I'm seeing some uh, services which are doing some interesting work. Uh, I haven't decided because uh, I personally haven't decided because uh, for for one thing, uh, I, I totally hear you on this. I never post anything. Uh, my expectations of privacy, uh, uh, I consider 
uh, social media as a public, public platform, no matter what they say, and my expectation of privacy is zero. Um, so I do not share whatever uh, I cannot, I'm not comfortable sharing uh, with anybody, uh, like everybody. So that's one. Number two is um, I, I kind of, I'm also trained as a risk analyst. So for me, I'm always thinking about the worst case scenario. I feel like whatever I'm creating there, there is a high possibility that I won't have my agency over it, my uh, ownership over it. Uh, so this is why I'm not sure. But like even even whatever, if I, we do something about it, uh, imagine the our statute or our legal jurisdiction uh, on this. Uh, things change so rapidly. Uh, if you are talking, we are talking about Meta right now because that's the that's the leading platforms. But for how many years? Uh, it, things uh, things change rapidly, and then. That's what bothers me most. Now, imagine we have credit cards, right? And sometimes we get the letters that, oh, this has been acquired by this and we'll have the data and we're going to protect with our life your data. And we're like, yeah, whatever. But what happens if one of these big giants of our time in our time dissolves and then who will have ownership of our data and why how who guarantees that they are going to be respectful to our thing because we have not in our conversation touched on other big social media or digital service provider giants beyond north america beyond europe right there are so many in so many other countries and um, their perspectives can be very different and value propositions can be very different. I'm not judging those. So uh, then uh, I'm not sure how they're going to do it. If from country X certain things uh, acquire our companies here um, and have ownership of our data, then poof, whatever we do is gone. Um, again, I, I sound very ominous here. I should not be. Uh, but what I'm saying is, this is something uh, I think uh, we cannot solve everything. We do not have the crystal ball. Uh, but whatever we can do is make sure that we also need to have an option where me as a user, uh, me as a single user and a citizen of uh, metaverse a citizen of google a citizen of uh, any countries will have a say to my things and uh, we'll have uh, within the given scenarios and given options can have uh, the capacity uh, to hold on to my own things at least that kind of uh, options or provisions should be there and at this point, it's it's kind of vague. It's definitely work in progress in different, and there's no industry standard. And unless we have that, now imagine I have to deal with, like any of us have to deal with all the platforms that we are using right now to make sure about our afterlife thing. There is not no single provisions for us to do this. So, so the, the burden is on us. Uh, and we absolutely have no idea how to do those things. That's scary. <laughs> now I'm going to be after this conversation, I'm going to be thinking more about my digital afterlife for sure. Uh, we look at Elon Musk and Neuralink, and this is a very futurism kind of question. So all speculation, but curious to see what you think. Elon Musk said that within the Neuralink, and this won't be anytime soon. Maybe it's a hundred years, maybe it's 50. We, we don't know, but the concept that we'll be able to upload our memories now. So when we get into our digital afterlife, that memory becomes a digital artifact as well. How do we even then protect those digital memories? Like, has that even been a conversation? I, I would imagine maybe, maybe not because it's so futuristic, but with now with, with what you just said is having major giants, uh, social media giants that are collecting all of this big data, those memories are big data. And so if you yeah. end up buying and or companies mm -hmm. coming together and buying that you could buy multiple memories mm -hmm. and, and control where this is distributed and where is it in privacy. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's a very big question, but what do we do when we get into elements like Neuralink coming in with our other digital artifacts so it is kind of out there right uh typically non mask of doing very things. elon uh, uh, so yeah. <laughs> but we are uploading our memories 
we are uploading our memories willingly and those our micro brains are already there it's, <laughs> already up, up. it's, right. it's there we are right. uploading willingly ourselves now imagine in in, in addition to this um um we are more or less guilty of uh, playing those apps right how do you look 50 years from now or how did you look 30 years before something like that. so these are also data points right uh, because those are the ai uh, dominated or machine learning things that kind of try to imagine or look into uh, our imaginations of uh, our ourselves and whatnot so all the things are there but i'm saying willingly now imagine you were talking about your digital diaries and everything uh uh, we are uh, we are also doing that uh, by, by ourselves. Um, so now we don't have to go farther for Elon Musk uh, on this neural link. So those things are there. And uh, again, uh, I would say that we need to be. Um, how should I say this? Um, we need to normalize. I'm, I'm going to. I'm going to repeat myself. But as an educator, I think it's kind of important to re re talk, reiterate it. Is we need to normalize it in a way that when we talk about different digital platforms as an omnipresent thing uh, in our life, that should be part of our second nature when we are using those things. Uh, um, I would like to have some sort of a curriculum in the school for that. Uh, where we talk about safety and security, stranger is danger. Like imagine that we normalized it. Uh, so then uh, I again have conversation with my nine-year-old on you should not trust anybody and everybody who are, who are you bumping into in Roblox. There are certain things. Um, so and also have an understanding that our perception, the conversation we are having right now, is based on our perception of privacy, our perception of society, our uh, perception about expectations of justice and equity. Uh, Make we need to make sure that other perceptions are also included there, so we are not imposing on 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 those ideas. Why it's important once you we do this, and it's it's a long long term game. It's a there's no quick fix to this. Uh, as uh, so the hope is when this neuralink comes in, at least we also have a sizable uh, amount, number of. Uh, netizens uh, who are aware of their rights and who are going to ask the right questions. I think that's great. It's true. And they're saying that I think in like 2000, I think it's when 2100 or something like that, it's going to be about 5 billion users. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's unbelievable that how many people will be, well, I well, should say have after digital life, um, after lives. Thank you so much for joining me today. Um, and the last question I want to ask you is, if you have to leave and make this conversation actionable for somebody, what would be the first thing you would tell them to do to start planning their digital afterlife? Uh, look into the platforms uh, where they are most active and see what are the provisions they have. Let's first make sure to make the best of it, to have at least some sort of an idea so we have the bare minimum security or backup. Uh, but at the same time, also to get rid of some of the things that you would not like to uh, share with anybody in your absence and, uh, you know, uh, be a bit careful and smart about the things that we do uh, as our digital artifacts. I think that's a great advice. Think before you post, that's for sure. We could say that to a lot of politicians and a lot of <laughs> certain people. Yeah, we'd say once uh, there, it's there, it's out there. Always lots of it's, it's yeah, it's once there. it's out there. You know, Twitter now has made that edit button, but that only lasts for so long. Yeah, so, a, right. Somewhere <laughs> somebody like is going to do the screen capture. That's for exactly. sure. <laughs> exactly. So with that, if you don't want it, if you wouldn't put it on a billboard, don't post it. Fahim, thank you so much for joining me today. And as I say to my guests, thank you for being rebelliously curious with me. Thank you so much. It, uh, it's been wonderful talking about that.